good evening. Let me make sure everyone can hear me. Can you verify? Yeah. Just to save ourselves a world of trouble here. Make sure we can be heard. I think they're checking right now. Yeah, okay. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, picking up where we left off this morning in verse 5. Starting in chapter 3 in verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on the fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. And doth the fountain send forth uh, at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross this evening. Give me the words to speak, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to all focus in on the word this evening, Lord. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. Be with us, strengthen us as we prepare to go out in this work week this week, Lord. May we be reminded of who we represent. May we be reminded of who our tongue should lift up, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll bless you your word this evening and apply it to our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. When we closed out this morning, we was looking at the destruction of the unruly tongue, the destruction that a, a tongue can cause, the harm that comes from a Christian speech. You know, we closed out even last Sunday talking about how faith without works is dead. And this week we talk about how a faith that does not change your speech, how a faith that does not change your tongue is also dead. James recognized that in this text here that we are all offenders. But if a man or a woman would just bridle their tongue, then they could bridle their whole body. He gave us examples this morning about how an entire horse is controlled with a little bridle, how a, an entire ship is controlled with a tidy little helm, with a tiny little rudder. And now in verse five, he says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know, he says there, and boasteth great things. A tongue that lift, lifts up itself ought to be a tongue that concerns you. A tongue that draws attention to oneself is a trouble that is a tongue that would bring you great concern. Remember what the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And that is the way of the world. You know, it, the Bible says for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, wherefore let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed and lest he fall. And trust me, James will eventually get to pride in James chapter 4 and verse 6, but where he says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But here the warning is about a tongue that boasts of itself. One man said a tongue that boasts is a tongue that invests into the witnessing 
of itself. It is a tongue that is committed to the endemic nature. And James says about this prideful tongue, behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. As we said this morning, behold, it is to strike wonder. Behold, it is to draw your eyes to marvel. It is, as one said, a divine highlighter. It is the underlighter. And James says here, behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. And this word great here denotes that of a forest. And what James is trying to say is how great, a, how great a matter, how great of a forest this little fire can set ablaze to. How this little fire can set an entire forest ablaze. You know, without a doubt, if we were to look over the past hundred years of history, we could pick out different segments of history, different moments of history where we could see the destructive power of the tongue. You know, the one that quickly comes to mind when we think about the destructive power of the tongue was that of World War II. In the Second World War, how many millions of lives were lost? 35 million lives lost. The brutality that was seen in the World War II is far beyond comprehension. All the children who died, all the parents who died, all the grandparents who died. It was said that the running joke of the place there called Auschwitz was everyone who enters through the gate leaves through the chimney. Where does this depravity come from? This vileness? How could this brutality ever come about? How do, how do we read about this and even understand that humanity could ever even do such a thing? How could the, an entire nation, how could they ever come to such resolve to commit such atrocities upon people? I tell you how. It was by the voice of a master order by the name of Adolf Hitler. He would, in a speech, whip a people into frenzy. He would just go crazy. What an order, what a speaker. With every sentence, his crowd, his followers, his generals would go into a frenzy of wickedness. And so what James is saying is so true. This tongue has the ability to set ablaze uh, an entire forest. Uh, for the people during the time of World War II, Hitler was the fire and Europe was the forest. I suppose that the question could be asked in each and every one of us as believers. The things that we said yesterday, the things that we spoke of this entire last week, if of the things that we said over the entire last week was to be published, was to be publicized, was to be said abroad. If the things that we spent most of our time in over the last week was to set a fire across this nation, what would be spreading across this nation? What from your life would, would be the passion? What would be the highlight of your life, the highlight of your speech? Over this last week, what has consumed your tongue in this last week? Hitler's tongue was a mere match. And the truth is, so is ours. Notice, though, of all the things that James could reference of the tongue, he references here the one thing, the, this one thing, the tongue that boasts. Proverbs 6 and verse 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And here we see these two companions, a proud look and a lying tongue. I, how many of us would want that to be said over our epithet? That the things that was drawn from our speech over the last week was a proud look. Uh, what was to be said if the, the things that was to be drawn from our speech over the last week was that of our lying tongue? So what James says here in verse 6 about this tongue is a tongue, the tongue, it is a fire, a world of iniquity. And so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body 
and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell, a world of iniquity. This world of iniquity, this word world obviously comes from this Greek word cosmos. It means that everything that was originally set in order, it literally encompasses everything in the world. So he says, the world, a world of iniquity. When James is saying this, literally he's saying an entire world of wrongdoing is encompassed in this tongue, an entire world of unrighteousness. I mean, you can go all the way back into the beginning of time. And can you not say that all of the unrighteousness and all of the troubles are encompassed in what? In the tongue? Was it not going back to the fork tongued devil who lied to Eve in the garden? And it was Eve when she was confronted that she used her tongue to blame Satan. It was Adam who used his, song, his tongue to when he partook of the fruit that he blamed God and Eve. It was Cain who used his tongue to say, am I my brother's keeper? And what about Moses? And what about Abraham? And what about Saul? And what about David? The tongue has brought forth an entire world of iniquity. It is to say that all the evil in the world rest in this tongue. I mean, think about the evil of the world today. When people manifest rage, how is it manifested? Through angry speech. How does bitterness get manifested today? Through sour speech. How does our hate get manifested today? Through this hateful speech. This mouth is the gate. And this gate can either be used to glorify God or it can be used of the devil. In the end of this verse here, in verse five, it is or verse six, it says, "And is set, and is set on fire of hell." You know, when we read in the book of Acts, and we're talking about the apostles, and we see these apostles preaching here, it says that their tongues were set on fire from where? From heaven. But we also see here that it's possible that you can have a tongue that is set on fire from hell. He says in verse 10, in verse six, so is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body. And this tongue is not an isolated infection. And this is also to say that the tongue knows no limits. However, the depra however depraved the man's heart is, so will his tongue be. There is no condition in an unregenerate man to where the tongue could not find itself and promote this condition. That's what Luke says, right? Out of the, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. As deep and as depraved and as wicked and as vile as Hitler was, his tongue promoted him and as it did it defiled the whole body and as wicked and as vile as he was his tongue promoted him and in his tongue promoted him his tongue promo uh, permeated everything around him the fallout of his speeches was felt in every way through world war ii you know, it was during World War II that we dropped those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And though hundreds of thousands of people died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were many other people who also fell sick. This was called nuclear fallout. The nuclear fallout of the decision to do this affected the lives all around where this decision was made. And so it is. When a child of God sets his tongue on a course, when a child of God is using his tongue for that of the devil, it, the, only, the, the fallout from there will not only be in that very moment, but it will affect those all around him. So James says, 
The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. The world of iniquity that is possessed by your tongue can and will defile your whole body. And he says here, not only your whole body, but also the wheel of your entire nature. You can expect this fallout. The lashing of the tongue is guaranteed to spread, to contaminate others, and setteth on fire here. This setteth on fire the course of nature. This word, uh, these words mean to, to literally the wheel of all human activity. This tongue has the ability to destroy. It is set on fire of hell. The uncontrolled tongue has a direct resource in which it draws from. The uncontrolled tongue draws from a pipeline of hell. Do you see what James is saying here? He is saying as destructive as hellfire is, so is your tongue in use for the devil. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. James says, what an amazing set of achievements we see here. Man has managed to tame every type of beast. It was two or three years ago that me and my family, we, we went to the circus and I remember looking down from up where we were sitting at as these men were walking into the cages with these lions. And I remember thinking, they have gone mad. And there's not a, a sane man in the world that would ever go in the cage with these lions. But these men, they didn't have much fear. Because why? Because the, the lions were tamed. But in my mind, the lions that I understood was the lions that we seen on the Discovery Channel. Yet, as wild as these beasts are, and yet all the destruction that a lion can cause, these men have tamed these lions. And then after the lions, then came the elephants, these grand beasts. And now after that, we seen one time at SeaWorld, these great killer orca whales, they were tamed. They were doing tricks. And after all of these tricks they were doing, it was amazing. And James even goes even further and he throws in serpents. What has not been tamed by mankind is really James's question. Uh, but he brings up all the things that man has had this ability to tame. He brings up all the things that man has brought under subjection. But in verse 8, he says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil and full of deadly poison. And when it speaks, deadly poison comes out of it. And James says it's full of deadly poison. With all the beasts that man can tame, with all of these grand beasts, these huge beasts, when we talked about the horses earlier, when we think about these animals that man have brought into subjection, and yet these are massive beasts, thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, and yet man has still not figured out how to bring under subjection a little six ounce slab of meat. What's James' point? James's point is what man needs, man cannot do. Man may have the ability to tame a lion. Man may have the ability to tame an elephant. He may be able to tame a serpent. He may be able to tame an orca whale. But to tame this tongue, it would take the work of God. It took the word of God to save you. And it will take the word of God to tame your tongue. No man can tame this. Uh, we need the Lord's help. We, we need God's help. Therewith, he says, bless we God, even the Father, th and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. What can be said about our tongue and its disloyalty to God? 
That we could even come to the house of God week after week. That we come here week after week and we sing to God. We praise the Lord. We sing hallelujah. And when we hear the preacher, we say amen and amen. And and we get excited about hearing the words of God. Yet we notice the disloyalty in our tongue because what? When we get home or when we get to our car, we hear the shoutings of our voices. Shut up. You're getting on my nerves. I can't stand you. Did you see brother so-and-so? Did you see sister so-and-so? Our tongues are so disloyal to the things of God. How does this work? Isn't this concerning about the lack of loyalty that our tongues have to God? Notice what he says here. One moment we bless God and the next minute we curse people made in his image. How does that work? It never ceases to amaze me that the deceitfulness of a, of a, of a wicked tongue, how wickedly clever a deceitful heart is. As we used to say when I was growing up, we would, we would make statements of, well, you surely pulled the wool over their eyes. You know, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, I, uh, I can never forget the time I had a friend that came over to my house. We were both involved in the same problems. We were both involved in the same sin. But when he came over to my house and he seen my mom, he said, oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am, we will be good. And when he seen my grandpa, yes, sir, we, we're not going to get any trouble at all. And I remember when he walked out the door before me, my mom said, I, I sure wish you had some manners like that. I remember thinking to myself, I would tell on him right now if I knew that it would not get me in trouble. It was a clever tongue, but he had a deceitful heart just like me. And though that they it may be a long time, and though it may be a long time ago that this happened, still not much has changed today. People are still putting on images. People are still putting on facades. One minute they're praising God with their tongue, and the next minute they're ripping people. There is a troubling disloyalty found in our tongue. There is not only a disloyalty, though, that James says, but there is a duplicity out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursing my brethren these things ought not be so notice what he's saying here it's almost like this is a Jekyll and Hyde situation and this is not two different people one person is speaking of blessings and the other is speaking of curses no James is saying out of the same mouth with the same tongue one person is at one moment you're blessing and at the next moment you're cursing James said this ought not be so and even more my brethren this should be troubling to our hearts James delivers his final example here in verse 11 and 12. Doth a fountain send forth at the same time? Uh, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. What's he driving home? We, 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 we know better than this already. We know that you cannot get sweet water and bitter water from the same place. We know that you cannot get olive berries from a fig tree. We know that you cannot draw salt water from the same place you draw fresh. And you cannot have a tongue that is in service to the edemic nature and also in service to the Holy Spirit. This is what he's driving home. And this is his concern. And this is his desire and that all would actually see the power that rests in an unruly tongue. The power of our speech, the destruction that it can cause, and the, the fact that it can set a course 
that it has the ability to destroy the entirety of that in which we are involved with. And yet in the same breath, in the same breath, for those who are committed, for those who are seeking after the Lord, for those who are begging for the Lord's help. The power that rests in the tongue goes the complete opposite way. It has the ability to set on fire and destroy an entire forest, and yet in the same breath, it has the ability to lift up Jesus and preach the name of Jesus and lead souls to Christ, yet in the same tongue, though there there should be no different differential speech, meaning we shouldn't at one moment praise God and the next moment curse the brother. James says this ought not to be so as we leave and go out and serve the Lord this week. Remember, remember and ponder on this as we go and interact with coworkers, as we interact with family. I just challenge us this week as we observe our speech, everything we say, ask ourselves this. If the things that we say in this very moment, if it was to be published abroad, would it be blessing or would it be cursing? Would it be glorifying to God or would it be hindering to his work? Would it bring people to him or would it push people away from him? What is with our speech, my brother? And you know, it was three different times in those short 12 verses that James kept drawing it back to the believer, to the believer, to the believer. He wasn't looking to the world about how they were living a duplicit life. He was talking to the believer and saying, listen, this ought not be so, my brother. We should guard our speech and walk in the statutes of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word. We give thanks to you, Lord, for all that you've done. Though the building is empty tonight, Lord, and we're just few in number, Lord, I pray that you'll uh, put your hand upon all those who are not here, Lord. Strengthen them, Lord, that we'll be coming forth into the services next week with excitement, Lord. Um, be praying this week about Justin White and his family getting here and arriving here, looking forward to those services. Lord, and as we seek to serve you, we give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.